عليك ان شاء الله بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبع الهدى اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وانزلنا عنا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Brothers in Islam, sisters, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase us all in beneficial knowledge, increase us all in goodness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descend His mercy and blessings upon this gathering. <coughs> we hope that it's one gathering full of uh, benefit and full of the remembrance of Allah and the remembrance of the Prophet Muhammad <laughs> So, <coughs> last night when we were going through the pillars of the prayer, I made a promise, I said that inshallah, whatever we didn't finish last night, we would try to finish this morning. Whatever we didn't finish last night, we would try to finish this morning. So we covered all of the shurud of the prayer. We covered all of the shurud of wudu. We took the sunan of wudu. We talked about the niyyah, the importance of niyyah and rectifying your intentions all the time. Then we moved on talking about the prayer, some of the virtues of the prayer. Uh, the merits, the great reward that the believers will have for the ones who um, constantly take care of their prayers. And then we moved on talking about some of the arkan of the prayer. And we said, who can recall how many rukan or how many arkan there are in the prayer for those who were here? Fourteen. Fourteen. Fourteen arkan in the prayer. We took the first rukan, which is what? What was the first rukan? Al Qiyamu Ma Al Qudra. Okay, standing up with the ability to do so. And we mentioned the hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in which he said, "Salli qaiman fa an lam yastati' fa qaidan fa an lam yastati' fa ala jump." Hadith of the Messenger of Allah, which says, "Pray standing up. If you don't have the ability to do so, then pray sitting down. If you don't have the ability to do so, then on your side, on your side." So, um, and we explain that in detail, um, that the individual who needs to sit down should only sit down in the particular position in the prayer in which he is not able <coughs> to fulfill um, the, that position or pray in that position correctly. It doesn't mean um, that you can sit in the whole chair throughout the whole prayer if you have, you know, just a pain in your ankles, but you can walk fine and things like this, right? The only position that it would be allowed for you to sit in the chair would be um, in the positions in which your ankle would be hurting you, things like this, such as the chashahud, such as the sitting uh, between the two sajdas and things like this. So next thing is the next rukun, which is what? Takbirat al-Ihram. Takbirat al-Ihram is the second pillar. وَسُمِّيَتْ هَذِهِ تَكْبِيرَةُ تَكْبِيرَةُ إِحْرَامُ لِأَنَّهَا مَفْتَاحُ الصَّلَاةِ وَأَوَّلُهَا وَالْمَدْخَلُ وَإِلَيْهَا So it's called Takbirat Ihram is because it is the key that actually or the doorway that opens up the door for you to enter into the prayer. Right? Takbirat Ihram meaning that once you say the Takbirat Ihram everything else from amongst the normal things that you do is now what? Haram for you to do. Such as what? Such as talking, okay. such as eating, such as the normal daily things that you would do, laughing out loud, right? Um, even making gestures, which are understandable, like if somebody comes into the masjid and, except for one gesture, right, that would not invalidate your prayer, is responding to the salam. Responding to the salam, which is wadid an nabi wadid an sahaba, that if you're praying and somebody comes in and they gives you the greeting, as alaykum wa rahmatullah, you respond with, the movement of the hand, raising the hand. That should be the only gesture. Taking out your phone and things like that, all of that now stops. Okay, all of that now stops. Any movement which is not necessary, you should try to avoid it to the best of your ability. Or if your phone is ringing and it's disturbing other people, then you should turn it off. Because now you're disturbing other people's worship. So uh, the takbir to ihram is the miftah of the prayer. Okay, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what did he say? He says, Takbiruha at Tahrim wa Taslimuha at Tahlil. He said that the Miftah of the prayer, you will enter into the prayer with the what? With the Takbir at Ahram, and you exit from the prayer with the what? Taslim. With the Taslim. Okay? Can I ask a question? Yeah. Some people come and join the Salah while it's already in progress, no. but they don't make the Takbir. They come there. Okay, well, they haven't entered into the prayer then. They have to make the Takbir at Ahram. This is actually the first, right? 
Rukun. Remember we talked about the difference between the Rukun and a Shart and a Wajib. Mm -hmm. A Rukun is something if it is not there in the prayer or in the action of worship, then it is not valid. So it's very important if you come late. For example, you come in the second Rakah and the Imam's in sujood. The first thing you should do, you shouldn't wait because you're going to miss the prayer. right? Enter into the prayer, no matter what position the Imam is in, don't wait. Don't wait for the next workout. Oh, I'll join from the beginning of the next workout. Make your takbir, Allahu Akbar, and then go. If he's in sujood, go into sujood. If he's in qiyam, if he's in ruku, whatever position he's in, right? You should make the takbir to ihram first and then move in to the position. You have, you have, um, you have to be in standing. Some people just come. Okay, well this happened in the time of the Prophet Muhammad too, right? Had the hadith of Abi Bakr, right? Where um, the Muslims were praying and they were in ruku. So he was so eager to, to catch that rak'ah that he made, he made ruku from the doorway and he walked into the prayer while he was in ruku. So the Prophet Muhammad he told him, he says, don't do that again. Right? He says, don't do that again. He said, don't do that again, but he didn't order him to, to repeat the prayer. So um, as long as you make the takbir to ihram, inshallah, you're good. You're good from the beginning. So you cannot enter the prayer except with what? Takbir to ihram. You can't enter it with Allahu Ajal, Allahu A'zam, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah. You have to enter the prayer with what? These specific wordings from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu which says what? Allahu Akbar. Because it is what? Tawqifiyya. Because ibadat are what? Tawqifiyya, right? We cannot change any of the ibadat. Yeah. Uh, if the Imam is in Ruku or in Sujood, so the person will do Allahu Akbar Takbir Ihram, then no. Allahu Akbar to go down. The second, uh, I mean, uh, silently, yeah. yeah. Silently. Yes. No. But sure. he, it has to be another Allahu Akbar. Well, normally when you're in the congregation, you don't really say the Takbirat, right? It's usually the Imam who is saying the Tikbirat. You would say them silently yes. and things like this. Yeah, that's no problem. That's it. Yeah. Uh, as we mentioned, الذي هو تحريم للصلاة فأنت تركع وتسجد وتخدع وتظل وتدعو تناجي وتسبح إلى غير ذلك تكبيرا لله سبحانه وتعالى. So just as I mentioned, right, that once you enter into the prayer and you say the takbir haram, everything else now becomes what haram for you to do. Everything from amongst the normal habitual actions that you would do, eating, drinking, talking, right now is the time that you focus and concentrate on Allah, who is who. Right? Allahu Akbar. Right? Allah should be the most important thing now. Leave all of your dunya affairs, your businesses, your investments, your family. Everything now is on hold now. Because you just said Allahu Akbar. Allah is the greatest. Allah is the most important now. Okay? Allah is the most important. And this is what you should be thinking about in your mind. Not just the ritual of Allahu Akbar. No. Allah really being conscious of what you're saying. Allahu Akbar, and then practicing it, okay? Um, and when you think about this, that Allah being so great, and the movements that you go through through the prayer, like for example, the prostration, you know, this is a, a humbling uh, thing, you know, when we think that we are so, you know, good, and, and sometimes a lot of us were overwhelmed with pride and arrogance and things like this, but when you put your face on the ground, right, this is what you should be really be remembering. Eh? Allahu Akbar and Subhanahu Rabbi Al-A'la, right, these adhkar, okay, that Allah, glory be to the one who is the most high. And now you are the most low, right. So whoever lowers himself for the sake of Allah, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will what? Will raise him. فَمَنْ دَخَلَ الصَّلَاةِ بِدُونْ هَذِهِ تَكْبِيرًا أَوْ بِلَفْضٍ آخِرٍ غَيْرِ تَكْبِيرٍ كَاللَّهُ أَعْلَمُ أَوْ اللَّهُ أَجَلُ أَوْ نَحْمُ ذَلِكَ فَإِنَّ الصَّلَاةُ لَا تَسْعَهُ so whoever enters into the prayer with any other wording or any other pronunciation except with Allah Akbar, then his prayer is not what? Is not valid. Now let's move on to the next rukun. Okay, I think that's clear. All of us right, understand that. What's the next rukun? Qira'at al-Fatiha. Reciting Surah al-Fatiha. Okay, which is the best and one of the best surahs in the Quran. A'zam surah in the Quran is Surah al-Fatiha. Some of the scholars of tafsir said it was revealed twice. Once in Mecca, once in Medina. 
<coughs> mentioned many times in the Quran. What is it called? Seven right? What else? Um al Quran, what else? Um al Kitab, what else? Fatihat al Kitab and many hadith. So in the Arabic language, anytime you find something which has a variety of different names, this shows us the importance of that thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about. For example, the day of resurrection. It's called what? Al Haqqa, Yawm al Deen, Yawm al Qiyamah, Al Qari'ah, Al Hakim al Takathur, right? What else? Al Waqi'ah, Al Akhirah, right? The Arab, when they would use different synonyms to have the same meaning, this means that this thing was great to them. Pay attention to these things. These things are important. So, similarly, Surah Al Fatiha, okay? Surah Al Fatiha. So, reciting Surah Al Fatiha in every single rak'ah in the prayer is a what? Is a rukun. No matter if it's an individual prayer or if it is what? Or a congregational prayer, okay? How many times on a daily basis should the believer be reciting Surah Al Fatiha if he's praying uh, the five daily prayers every day? At least 17 times a day. 17 times a day. We want to hold the questions to the end, inshallah, Dr. Yusuf. So, وَلِهَذَا فَإِنَّ الْفَاتِحَا أَفْتَرَضَ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَىٰ عَلَىٰ إِبَابِ قِرَاءَتَهَا فِي الْيَوْمِ وَالْلَيْدَةِ سَبْعَ عَشَرَ مَرَّةً وَهَذَا مِمَّا يَدُلُّ عَلَىٰ عَظِيمٍ شَأْنِ الْفَاتِحَةِ وَمِنْ عَظِيمٍ شَأْنِهَا فِي الصَّلَاةِ أَنَّ اللَّهَ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَىٰ سَمَّاهَا الصَّلَاةِ كَمَا فِي حَدِيثِ الْقُدْسِ And also from the names that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala named Surah Al-Fatiha is what? As-Salaat. He called Surah Al-Fatiha As-Salaat, prayer. In the Hadith Qudsi, which he said, I have divided my prayer or Surah Al-Fatiha into two parts. One half of it is for me, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the other half is for the servant. And the servant will receive what he asks for. So when the servant, he says, right, as it comes in the Hadith, Qasamtu Salata, بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَ عَبْدِي نِسْفَيْنِ وَلِعَبْدِي مَا سَأَلْ فَإِذَا قَالَ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ قَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى حَمَدَنِي عَبْدِي This is what should be in the believer's mind when he's praying. When he's saying, الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ He knows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is responding to him. And Allah is saying to him, My servant has praised me. So when we pray, we're actually communicating with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is very important that the believer constantly has that means of communication open with Allah at least five times a day. Okay? Just think about how many times you call your wife or you call you know, your relatives and things like that, right? When you have a problem, when you have a difficulty, when you need help, when you need aid, you're always in touch with sometimes your brother or sometimes your wife. Hey, I'm going here, this is what I'm doing, this is what's going on. What about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So this is the time that you are communicating with Allah and Allah is actually responding to you. So when we say, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Allah he says what? Hamadani Abdi, my servant has praised me. Then when the believer he says, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, what does Allah say? Athna alayya Abdi, my servant is praising me even more. Then when we say, Maliki Yawm al he says, Allah, Allah he says, Majadani Abdi, that my servant is right glorifying me. In such a glorious manner. فَإِذَا قَالَ إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ He says, هَذَا بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَ عَبْدِي وَلِعَبْدِ مَا سَأَلْ He says, now, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ He says, this is a, a, a relationship between me and my servant. And whatever my servant asks for, I will give it to him. So the first three verses are for who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so all praising of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mentioning His beautiful names, mentioning His wonderful attributes, okay? Now, you're singling Allah out in this ayat right here. إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ You are the one we seek aid and assistance from, and only you are the one who we what? Who we uh, worship. Okay? So you're singling out, this is the tawheed of what? Tawheed of al-uluhiyyah. Okay? The tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's worship, singling the worship out only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. The first three are what? Tawheed al rububiyyah and Tawheed al asma wa sifat Okay, when you say Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, the Lord of the universe, the Lord of all of mankind, the Lord of all of creation. Okay, this is Tawheed al rububiyyah 
at its finest, that Allah, He is the Lord, the Creator, the Sustainer, the Planner of everything in creation. All of the seen, all of the unseen worlds. That's what the Alameen is. Okay? All of the seen things, all of the unseen creatures. Okay? And now when you Sarat Muslim, now you're asking Allah for something. Oh Allah, guide me to the straight path. The straight path in which you have bestowed upon those whom you love and who have earned your favor, and not the path of those who have gone astray, nor the path of those who have earned Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's anger. So and then after you read that verse, Allah says, Hada li abdi wa li abdi ma sal. Same as he said after Iyakan Abun wa Iyakan Asneen. So from this had Surah Al Fatiha has so many benefits, so many fawa'id that we can learn in how the adab and the manners of how to make dua. The first thing that you should start off with is what when you make dua? Mentioning Allah's names and attributes. Okay? This is why Allah has names and attributes. Walillahi asma ul husna. Allah says He has beautiful names, perfect and complete names. What do you do with them? You make the supplication to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala using these names. Okay, these are like the keys to your dua. When you start your dua, these are what you should start off with. Ar-Rahman, Ar-Hamni. Ya Ar-Rahim, Ar-Hamni. Ya Ghafur, Iqfilli. Ya Al-Aziz, Izzni. Ya Al-Alim, Alimni. Ya Al-Hakim, Zidni Hikmatan. Right? You use the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is in correspondence to what the thing that you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. Ar-Razaq, Ya Ar-Razaq, Urzuqni. Oh Ar-Razaq, the one who gives sustenance, give me more sustenance. Okay? So these are the manners. Allah loves to be praised. And you see, just praising Allah in Surah Al-Fatiha, Allah is responding to you. He's happy when you praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's two different types of dua, two different types of supplication that the believer can um, practice. And we have that also in Surah Al-Fatiha. What are the two types of dua? Dua al-mas'alah and what? Dua al-thana. Okay, the type of supplication in which you are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something that you need to remove a hardship, to help you in times of distress and things like this, or to what? Uh, or another type of dua, which is dua al-thana, which is just praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this, and many times, was the dua and supplications of the previous prophets and the previous messengers. Right? Yunus, alayhi salam. Ish dua al-Yunus. Lamma kana fi batan al-Hud. When Yunus was in the belly of the whale, what did he say? Did he say, oh Allah, get me out of here. Oh Allah, I'm in distress. Oh Allah, get me out of here. What? He was patient. But he, what was his dua? All dua athana and dua i'tiraf. That, oh Allah, there's no deity except for you. Glory be to you, and I have oppressed myself. He didn't say it was his fault or this one's fault or because I left from my people and then the whale ate me and things like this. No. He praised Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then Allah opened up the, the doors for him. So this is also. Uh, what about the du'a of Ayyub alayhi salam? Same thing, right? He went through so many trials and tribulations in his life. Lost his children, lost his wealth, lost his house, <coughs> lost his family, became sick. Right? Did he start asking Allah for anything? He didn't ask Allah for anything. He just started to praise <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is what we should learn, the manners and etiquettes of the prophets and how to supplicate to Allah. That no matter what hardship, difficulty we're going through, continue making the praise of Allah and Allah will what? open up the doors for you. So, um, we mentioned some of the asma of the Surah Al-Fatiha, which is what? Umm Al-Qur'an. Right? Umm Al-Qur'an. The mother of the Qur'an, I guess you could say, or you can say the lub of the Qur'an, right? The umm in Arabic language means the center of something. Cool. Right, the center, the core of something. Okay, so when you look at Surah Al Fatiha, and this is what the scholars of Tafsir say, they say all of the themes and the topics in Surah Al Fatiha, okay, these are all of the themes and the topics within the whole Quran. <laughs> so the Fatiha, which is called the Fatiha, which is, means what? The opening or the introduction to the book. This is why it's in the beginning of the Quran, because now when you start opening the other surahs, there's more detailed explanation of all of the themes and topics that are in what? Okay. Surah Al-Fatiha. Surah Al-Baqarah, Ali Imran, and Nisa, Ma'idah, and Am, and you just go all through the Quran, you're going to find the same themes 
that are mentioned in Surah Al Hadir, but on a more detailed explanation. Like, take the last ayah, right? Surah Al Ladina Anamta Alayhim, Gayru Magdubi Alayhim, Raddalin. Allah then He goes into detail, right? He starts explaining <coughs> who are the people of Ahl Kitab. Why did they go astray, right? Allah starts explaining the people, the Yahud. Right? What is their problem? What did they do? Killing the prophets, talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, saying that Allah is ignorant, saying that they are rich and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is poor. So all of the surahs that come after Fatiha, these are explanations of what? A more detailed explanation of what is contained in Surah Al-Fatiha. Um, so, فَإِذَا كَانَ مَطْلُوبٌ مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِ أَنْ يَتَدَبَّرَ الْقُرْآنَ فَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ And if it is demanded and required for the Muslim to ponder over the Qur'an and ponder over its meanings. Okay? This is what is obligatory upon every Muslim, is that he does what? He ponders and contemplates over the meanings of the Qur'an. Okay? We should try to memorize as much Qur'an as possible. And we know the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ told us, خَيْرُكُمْ مَنْ تَعَلَّمَ الْقُرْآنُ وَعَلَّمُهُ That the best people are those who learn the Qur'an and teach it to others. Okay? But we shouldn't just stop with memorization of the Qur'an. That should be the first step. That's the baby step. You memorize the whole Qur'an. Then the next step, tafsir. Then the next step, different qira'at. Then the next step, uh, the ahkam. Then the next step, you just keep going. Memorizing the Qur'an is just the first step, the baby step. Okay? So, the believer, he should be more focused. The ones who cannot memorize the Qur'an, have tried so hard and things like this, they should try to understand the Qur'an because this is what is obligatory. Okay? It's not obligatory upon everybody to memorize the whole Qur'an. It's very highly desirable and highly recommended and preferable that a Muslim does that. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasn't blessed all of the Muslims to be able to memorize the Qur'an. Right? That's the reality. And many people don't have the time, nor do they have the commitment, nor do they have the dedication to memorize the whole Qur'an. So, at least that we can do is try to ponder over the meanings. Okay? Ponder over the meanings and try to understand the meanings. Go back to the books of Tafsir to try to understand as much Qur'an as possible. So, uh, this surah, okay, this surah, reciting this surah in the prayer, it is a rukun. Okay, it is a rukun. Because the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what did he say? La salata liman lam yaqra bi fatihat al kitab. He said there is no prayer at all for the one who does not recite the surah al fatiha. So the way that this hadith came, mutlaqan, Okay, means that every prayer, no matter if it's janaza prayer, whether if it's witr, whether if it's individual prayer, whether it's the imam praying, whether it's the congregation behind the imam, whether you're praying in the masjid, praying at home. Every single believer has to recite Surah Al-Fatiha in every single rak'ah. And the recitation of the imam is not sufficient for the recitation of the what? Of the ma'mum, based upon this authentic hadith, okay, which is narrated in Sahih Bukhari, okay. So, what do we do? Like, for example, if when you're praying in congregation, and the Imam, he's reciting Surah Al-Fatiha. This happens many times. Sometimes the Imam, he recites quickly. Okay? And normally between the time he finishes Fatiha and the time that he starts a new Surah, you would recite your Fatiha when you're praying in congregation. But what if sometimes the Imam, he prays quick and he doesn't give you time to recite Surah Al-Fatiha? When do you recite it? Do you have to recite it? Or... Is it sufficient enough just to go with the recitation of the Imam and you don't have to recite it at all? Based upon this hadith, you have to recite it, okay? But you have two options. Number one, if you can fit it in between the end of his recitation of Surah Al-Fatiha and the next surah, you should do it then. Or you can recite it when? What's another time you can recite it? Okay, what if there's no time? He says, Surat al Adina Alayhim, Ghayru Magdubi Alayhim, Muladdalin, Ameen, Alif Lameen, Dalik al Kitab, You have no time, right? So what do you do? Don't read it? Do you read it? No read. You have to read it. Because it's a Rukun. Probably he just said, La salata di manne makra bi fatihat al kitab. So, we have another hadith which actually explains this in more detail. 
the companions were actually at one time reciting when the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was reciting Quran. So after the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, commenced and finished the prayer, he turned around. And he says, who was, reciting, who was reciting while I was reciting in the prayer? And one of the companions he says, I did. So he says, do not recite while I'm reciting, except with Surat al-Fatiha. Except with Surat al-Fatiha. So this explains, right, and gives us a makhraj for this issue here. Right, that you can either recite Surat al-Fatiha when? With the with Imam. Him. Don't precede the Imam with him or a little bit behind him, okay? Or you can recite it when? When he's reciting the next surah, okay? Because now reciting Fatiha is what? Rukun. And you listening to him recite the next surah after Fatiha it becomes what now? Desirable and Sunnah and Mustahab, okay? <coughs> So that, those are the two options you have. You either recite it when the Imam is reciting, but you're not reciting it out loud because you don't want to disturb the other congregants in the prayer and you don't want to mix the Imam up as well. So you would recite, for, for example, the Imam's reciting, you would recite, like this. Okay? And that's another benefit that I wanted to remind you all about too, is the importance of when you recite, that your lips should be moving. In Arabic language, the word al qiraa this is what the word al qiraa means. That you're actually tamur wa tatharrik lisanik wa shafatik. Okay, qiraa was not known. When you look in any of the books of fiqh, they're all going to say that you have to actually move your lips. Your lips have to be moving, even though you're reciting silently. Okay, there has to be some movement in your mouth and movement in your lips. And the companions even described that was how the Prophet Muhammad would pray. When they were behind him, they would see his beard moving. Meaning that his jawbone was moving and he was reciting in that way. Right? Also, um, another thing which is important for us to know and be reminded about is... Um, sometimes the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, during the silent prayers, he would occasionally read the verse out loud. In Dhuhr and Asr, he would occasionally read the verse out loud, like he would be reciting Mag. Then he would go into Surah Al A'la, for example, in, in Dhuhr prayer. Right? And then he would go back side. So occasionally he would he would recite verses out loud, right, to let the congregation know that he was number one reciting and maybe what surah he was reciting. That's why when we look into the books that describe the prayer of the Prophet Muhammad, you have everything recorded. The companions know what surah the Prophet Muhammad would normally pray and read with in Dhuhr, what surah he would read with a lot of times in Asr, what surahs he would read with during the silent prayers because the Prophet would sometimes, occasionally, um, recite a verse out loud. Okay? Um, so, everybody good on that pillar? Sometimes you see Salat al-Iman turn on Salat al-Ma'mun, Salat al-Jahriya. Yeah, this is an ikhtilaf amongst the scholars of fiqh. And, uh, but the safest and uh, the, the, the most uh, preponderant approach, strongest approach to take is based on this hadith. La salata li man bi fatihat al-kitab. Right? That there's no prayer for the one who doesn't read with fatihat al-kitab. Whether it's congregation or whether it's what? Individual prayer. And Allah knows best. The next rukun is al rukur Okay, the next rukun is al rukur You have to make rukur and you have to bow down in, uh, in the prayer. Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, irka'u wasjudu wa'abudu rabbakum. All you who believe, make ruku together, all of you, and make sujood, prostration, all, of to all together, and worship Allah, your Lord, all of you together. Okay? Warka'u ma'a ar-raki'een. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, 
So Rukunun min Arkan Salah, La Tasahu il Dabihi, Wafi Hadithi Messi is Salah to who call a Salah alayhi wa sallam, Thumarka Hatta Tatama in Rakian. This is important, right? When one of the companions who had a problem praying, okay, the Prophet Muhammad was teaching him how to pray. He didn't know how to pray, right? He was new. So the Prophet, he told him, he says, when you make rukur, make sure that you are calm while you are making rukur, okay? And this is another pillar which we're going to talk about, atam'adnina, right? Atam'adnina, having calmness throughout the different movements in the prayer, okay? Which is a rukun. You cannot be just, you know, going through like you're doing exercise or something like that, yoga, toe touches or, you know, uh, whatever type of exercises that people do, right? Every movement has a particular dua and every movement has a, you know, Allahu Akbar to signify that you're moving to the next movement, right? And right, every movement you should have right, a short period of time in which you are focused and concentrated on that movement and in which you are what? Attaining khushur, humility, and focusing and concentrating on making supplication to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the next, or the part which is related to a ruku, how should you make a ruku? How should your pack be when you make a ruku? We have many people who go, some people go all the way down. Can somebody demonstrate for us so I can show? Yalla, do All right, yalla. Yeah, come here so we can see. All right, so, all right, a ruku, how should you make ruku? Huh? Ruku, your back should be completely straight. The, 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 the scholars of fiqh, and even we have narrations from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, that the Prophet Muhammad's back would be so straight as though you could sit a glass or a cup on the back and it wouldn't fall off. Okay. Some people they go down like this, thinking that the lower you go, the more humility you're showing to Allah subhanahu wa taala, and you see that his back is curved. Okay. Or some people they go. Right, they up. Maybe some people, this is, you know, some people have back problems and things like this, this is no issue. But if somebody has the ability to make ruku and keep his back straight, then this is um, something that, which is a rukun of the prayer which he needs to do to the best of his ability. So those are the uh, three demonstrations of, right, some of the types of ruku which are, um, which are not from the sunnah and then the type of ruku which is considered to be from the sunnah and actually is a rukun in the prayer. Then also, al-i'tidalu ba'd al-ruku. Okay, al-i'tidalu ba'd al-ruku. Coming straight up. Okay, al-i'tidalu, straightening the bones in your spinal column have to be straight. Okay, many people when they're in a rush, they're praying and things like this, they come up from ruku, they come halfway, let's, let me, <laughs> When they come up from Rukur, they may be in a rush, they have to go back to work, or they got a call on their Uber, the guy's waiting for him and things like this. Come halfway up and go down for the sujood. Some people, they just do like that. Right? They're in a rush. Right? Then you have not fulfilled part of the pillar of what? Of Rukur. Okay? You have to come all the way up, stay for a period of time, then go down into sujood, go down into sujood, stay here next to me, no well, <laughs> So, um, so making your back straight, okay, coming up from ruku, okay. Uh, and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said, he said, aswa al nasi sariqatan aladhi yasriqu fi min salatihi. Qalu ya Rasulullah, wa kaifa yasriqu min salatihi? قَالَ لَا يُتِمُّ الرُّكُوعَهَا وَلَا سُجُودَهَا أَوْ قَالَ لَا يُقِيمُ صُلْبَهُ فِي الرُّكُوعِ وَالسُجُودِ A very important hadith. The Prophet Muhammad, he said that the worst type of people who get attacked or become affected by the thieves, okay, is the one who has someone taken away, it's something taken away from his prayer. The one who has reward or ajr, or blessings taken away from his prayer. This is the worst type of thievery, okay? When you get the reward taken away from you in your prayer, or some of the reward taken away from you in your prayer. So the companions, they said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, how can somebody uh, be you know, robbed 
during their prayer. How can somebody have something stolen from them in their prayer? So he said, لا يتم ركوعها ولا سجودها is that he does not complete or does not perfect their ruku', their bowing, or they do not perfect or complete their what? Their sujood. And in another narration, لا يقيم صلبه في الركوع وسجود that his back is not straight in ruku' or sujood. So these type of things where the back is curved or you're not coming all the way up from Ruku, these are things which remove some of the barakah and some of the reward that you're getting for your what? For your prayer. Okay. Next thing, a sujood ala a'da as sabah. A sujudu ala a'da as sabah. Making prostration upon seven limbs, upon seven organs of your body. Okay? Or seven limbs or seven parts of your body. What are the seven? Who can tell us what are the seven? Head, face, huh? forehead. The forehead. Okay, he says the forehead. What do you say? Hands. The hands. Okay, the hand. That's okay. So we have how many here? One. Is it only the forehead or only the nose? Both. 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 It's important, right? Jebha, right here. So when you make prostration, it should be like this. Not what some people show us. What some kids do, right? <laughs> The roll, they do the roll. You know the roll thing? They do the roll thing, like this, right? The, the kids, they all, they love, bless them. They do the rolling technique, like this. They go down for sujood. <laughs> That's not sujood, because why? They didn't touch their nose. Other people, I don't know uh, why they do it, but it's very strange. It seems like they're afraid to put their face on the ground or something. Maybe the, the rug you know, has dust or particles or something like that, bacteria, so they only go like this. They only put their nose. They're like scared to go down to Ruku. Like that. Like pecking like a chicken. That is the Prophet Muhammad said in the Hadith. But he was uh, implying about the one who what? Who goes down quick in his sujood? Ah, yankurk nakar dajaj, right? <laughs> so that's one thing, okay, in regards to the face. And Allah subhanahu wa taala says, Ya ayyuha ladina amanu arkaru wasjudu wa abudu rabbakum wa fadlu khair la alakum tuflihun. Oh, you who believe, okay. So the proof for sujood and the that you have to make prostration upon seven limbs is number one, the verse in the Quran where Allah orders us to make sujood, okay. Uh, and this is an order, a command, an imperative in the Arabic language. And anytime we have something which is imperative in the Arabic language in the Quran, and you don't have a sarifa, something which uh, removes it from being obligatory to being of, of lesser a legal status to mustahab, then it is what? Obligatory. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa says, Umirtu an asjuda ala sab'ati a'zamin ala jabha wa ashara bi yadihi ala anfihi. Okay? The Prophet, he says, I was commanded to pray on seven limbs. To pray on seven limbs, then he pointed to what? He pointed to his nose. He pointed to his nose, okay? And jabhatu wal anf, here. So, okay, the forehead and the nose. Wal yadain wal rukbatain wa atraf al qadamain. Okay, so the two hands, okay? The two hands and the two knees and the Toes. Toes, okay? Which direction should all of them be facing? Qibla. The Qibla, okay? Not like this, okay? How should the hands be placed on the ground? Some brothers, mashallah, like they're doing push ups or something sometimes. They go down like this with their fists. Some people, they go down on their fingertips, okay? When the Prophet Muhammad would make sujood, he would put his, right, a kaf. Right, right, yadhi. He would put his palms of his hands, right, on the on the the ground or on the place where he was making prostration. And then we're going to take later, if we have time, how the Prophet would have his hands. Would his hands be open like this, or would they be closed? His fingers would be closed. Okay. Normally, in all of the positions that his hands were in in the prayer, his fingers would be what closed together, except for when he would grab his knees in ruku', then they would be opened, then they would be opened, okay? But also sitting down for the tashahid, hands would be closed, the fingers would be closed and they wouldn't be open as such. So next pillar, right? As-sabi'u al-raf'u minhu. 
Al-Raf'umin. Any questions about sujood? So what are some what are some types of sujood that people make which not would not be accepted? Another thing is when the people lift up the feet. Okay? You've missed the rukun of the prayer. If you're both of your feet do not touch the ground at the same time that the rest of your limbs do, then you have missed that rukun in the prayer. Okay, some people show us, you know how they pray with their feet up? Like this. Yeah, the feet come up. You haven't fulfilled that rukun of sujood. Not even if one, let's say one, put one down and one up. You haven't fulfilled the rukun in the prayer. Because both. Up and down. Huh? Up and down. Make it up and down. Up and down? Yeah, I will do this here. Okay, like that. Yes, and also put your, your put point your feet towards the back wall behind you. And put yeah, like that. No, no, like how you were so they can see. Yeah, like that. The tips this would be counted as you fulfilling the obligation, but it's not fulfilling the sunnah. Why? Because the toes are not pointed towards the qibla. The toes are not pointed towards the qibla. Okay, just up okay. Well rough okay, and then coming up from what? Coming up from sujood, coming up from sujood, okay? ثم أرفع حتى تطمئن جالس and then come up from okay sujood and sit with calmness and peace and tranquility. How should you sit in the in the 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 jalsa baina sajdatain? How should you sit? Who can show us how? It's two different ways that came in hadith from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. One is okay, like the brother. Turn around so they can see, please, right? One way, well, no, that's tawarruk. Yeah, that's tawarruk. Turn around all the way so they can see your feet. Yeah, you have to look here. Getting some exercise today. Yeah. So, all right, he's sitting on his left foot, right? And his right foot, right, is up. Okay, that's one way to sit between the two sajdas. Okay? Another way, which comes in some hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, is called, right, iqa'a. Who knows what that is? Ah, uh, you sit on the heels of both feet. You sit on the heels. No, just how this one is. Sit. No, put your heels together. Put your heels together and sit on the heels of your feet like this. Okay. But this only came in the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallam between the two sajdas. Okay. This sitting, this sitting only came between the two sajdas. Okay. The Prophet actually prohibited you, prohibited us from praying, sitting like that in any other position in the prayer except for the what? The two sajdas. Okay. Ah, so the only time you should sit in that position is when is between the two sajdas. So you have two options between the two sajdas, either the first one that the brother did or this one right here. Okay, and this can only be done when between the two sajdas. It shouldn't be done when you're sitting in tashahud. It shouldn't be done towards the end of the prayer as well, because the Prophet, he said, right, do not sit as the dog sits in the prayer. That's how a dog sits. It sits on its, on its heels, on its, on its feet, if you ever see a dog. So two positions that we should try to be, um, stay away from that is similar to how a dog prays. Number one, the forearms, okay, on the ground when you make sujood, and also sitting like that in the end of the prayer, either in the shahad al-awwal or the shahad al-thani, like the brother demonstrated right now. Okay, except if you, you have an exception. You can sit that way, right, if you have problems or something like that, right, you cannot sit on the, the, the uh, you know, you cannot put your foot down straight where you may have a knee problem or foot problem, then you can sit like that, right, you have an excuse. But otherwise, there's no excuse for, for sitting that way. How about the, when you're going down in sujood? Going down into sujood, excellent, excellent question, very good question. When should you go down into sujood? Let's say we're praying in congregation. Okay. Let's say we're praying in congregation like this morning, for example. The Imam, may Allah bless him. <laughs> the Imam who prayed with us this morning, right? He practiced the sunnah of when to say the takbir for going into sujood. Okay? You should say the takbir when you're when you go into sujood, when you're standing up completely, you say Allah Akbar, then you go down, not while you are descending. So when should the congregation make sujood? That's a question. Because we have to be careful. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, right? إِنَّمَا جُعِلَ الْإِمَامُ لِيُؤْتَمَّ بِهِ He said the Imam has been 
placed as the leader of the prayer so that you follow him, that you do not precede him, supersede him, do things before him. Okay? And the Prophet he severely warned the Muslims from superseding the Imam. And he says, Whoever supersedes the Imam, then I fear that his face will be changed into the face of a donkey. So this shows the importance of following the Imam. Not only following the Imam in the prayer, but following the Imam in everything. The Imam should be the leader of the community. Okay? So when should the congregation go down to make sujood? We have some narrations in Sahih Bukhari that the companions, they would not move their backs until they saw the Prophet Muhammad's face on the ground. They would not move their backs to go into sujood until they saw the Prophet Muhammad's face completely on the ground. Completely on the ground. Okay? So once you see the Imam's face hit the ground, hit the floor, he's in sujood, then you start moving into sujood. Not with the Imam. Right? Our, some of our brothers, may Allah guide us and guide them and help us and aid us and aid them. There's like they're competing with the Imam. Right? You see some brothers in sujood sometimes. Alright? The Imam, he comes up from sujood, Allah Akbar. Right? He sits for maybe, you know, a couple seconds, but you see the other brothers, they're like, getting ready, I'm ready to go, you know? Before the Imam even moves. Okay? This is something we should try to avoid. Something we should try to avoid, and we don't move until we see the Imam move. And okay? how do you go down? How do you go down? You go on your knees first, you go on your hands first. We have a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, do not... Uh, he says, do not uh, descend or do not go down to sujood or come down as a camel comes down. Okay? So, have you ever seen a camel descend to the ground? Okay, a camel, they have front legs and back legs. But the front legs of the camel right, are called the what? The yed or the rijal? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, the uh, <laughs> So the scholars they differ in the naming of the two front legs and the two back legs. So those who say that the two front legs are similar to our knees, then you should not go down on your knees first. The ones who say that the two back legs right are similar to our knees say that you shouldn't go down on your Hands first, okay? So there's some difference of opinion in the scholars, but both of them are acceptable. Both of them are acceptable. If you go down on your knees first, or you go down on your hands first, they are both acceptable, and they are both valid opinions of, of the scholars, inshaAllah ta'ala. So the next one, okay, a jalsa bayna sajdatain, we talked about that, sitting between the two sajdas, okay? The next one, which is, Related to all of the other pillars, okay? having calmness and tranquility in all movements throughout the prayer. This is very important. <coughs> if we want success, if we want peace of mind, if we want all of our worries, all of our distresses and hardships to be removed, if we want success in this world and the next, what do we have to do? What do we have to be? How do we have to be in our prayers? What does Allah tell us in Surah Al-Mukminun? <laughs> the believers have indeed attained success. And then he goes on to explaining. The first thing that will give them success is what? Those who have kushur, in their prayers. What is khushu'ah? How do we attain khushu'ah? How do we increase our khushu'ah? Tumma'neena. Ah, tumma'neena. Okay, what else? What are other things that can help us with our khushu'ah in the prayer? I believe, I believe wholeheartedly that a lot of the mental issues, a lot of the problems, waswasa and things like this that brothers and sisters may be experiencing is because they're <coughs> not giving the proper time to their prayers. They're not having the khushu'ah in their prayers. Their mind is preoccupied with Everything else, and they're not focused on their prayer. Their khushu is little. And you always imagine the presence of Allah. Of Allah, as it comes in hadith. Right? That when you come and you make takbir to ihram, that the hadith says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually 
right, standing in front of you. Not literally, but this is the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine if you were standing in front of the king, or the king of, uh, you know, I don't know. A lot of kings, <laughs> you don't want to go out and stand in front of them, no. Right? Uh, but let's say you, you were standing in front of, you know, uh, somebody you respected highly and dearly from amongst your your grandfather or something like that, you know, or your father. The big boss. Right? The big boss. How would you be standing in front of him? You'd be standing in front of him, humble, humility, right? Respect. Uh, yeah, of course. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is the King of the Kings and the Lord of the Lords, right? He's deserving the utmost respect and honor and attention and focus and things like that. Okay, so that's one thing that will help us with the khushu, that we're actually standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That number two, Allah, He's responding to us when I say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Hamadani Abdi, Allah, He's speaking to us. Even though we may not hear it, we still know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is responding to us. Okay, so. Khushur, how is khushu gained in the prayer? What are some things that can help us with khushu? Okay, going through the movements slowly, focusing on the supplications in the prayer. Every movement in the prayer, there is a dua. As salatu, ma'naha ad dua. Right? The prayer actually comes from the meaning of what? A dua of supplication and making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So every movement in the prayer, you should be reciting the supplications. Every movement. You have Allahu Akbar to signify the movement in the prayer. Then every position. In Ruku, Subhana Rabbil Azim. In Sujood, Subhana Rabbil A'la. Right? Between the Sajdatain, Rabbik Firmi, Rabbik Firmi, Rabbik Firmi. Right? You go uh, in the Tashahr. Right? Dua. <coughs> the whole prayer is Dua. You should be focused on supplicating to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Next thing. Next pillar is, or part of the pillar that we previously mentioned. Excuse me, Aki. Yeah. You're focusing on the area that you're going to prostrate. You're not looking around, eyes in the sky. Or, you know. No, that's another important thing that will help you with your... Khushu. Is the prophet, he actually prohibited from looking up in the sky. In the prayer. So... What we know is from the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallam is looking at your place of what? Place of prostration. And he said, Al-Iltifat in the prayer is from the Shaytan. And it takes away from the Ajr of your prayer. So looking to the left, looking to the right. Okay. So your eyes should be either focused here on your place of prostration or focused at the Imam. Okay. Not focused on anything else. What is the name of the shaitan who comes and whispers to us in the name in the prayer? There's a specific shaitan who is from the agents of Iblis who comes and disturbs people in their prayers. Anybody know? Anybody remember? Khanzab. <coughs> Khanzab. <coughs> So what do you do if you feel like what's what's or feel distracted in your prayer and things like this? What do you do? What did the Prophet guide us to do? Ah, you say "A'udhu billahi min al khanzab," right? "A'udhu billahi min al khanzab," and then what do you do? Tatful ala yisarik three times. Your your left side, right? "A'udhu billahi min al khanzab," then focus back in your prayer. So anytime you have any what's what's, anytime you have. You're being overwhelmed by distractions and things like that. This is the cure. This is the remedy to get back and get focused on your prayer. Uh, so the next thing, tartibu uh, bain al-arkan, right? That all of the arkan have to be what? Have to be in order. This is not something I think we have to discuss in detail. All of you know that because the Prophet he said, "Sallu kama ra'aytamuni usalli." He says, "Pray as you have seen as you have seen me praying." Okay, that is the best way. And if we think about how did the companions, how did the um, the disciples of the Prophet Muhammad, so how did they learn the prayer from the Prophet Muhammad? Did, was the Prophet sitting there teaching them, this is a rukan, this is a shart, this is wajib, this is sunnah, like how we're learning today. This is this is rukan, this is wajib, this is sunnah. Well, did he sit down with them and teach them? To pray like this, and what are the important pillars and things like that? Or how did they know? They imitated him. They imitated him. 
that ittiba, imitation of the Prophet Muhammad This is why they were so successful. If you compare it to the success that they had, compared to the success that the Muslims have in, in, in this life, there's no comparison at all. And they didn't have anything from the dunya. They didn't have all this technology that we have, all of these, you know, if you think about like from a military perspective and things like this, so many Muslim nations and things like that, they have all weapons and things like that, and tanks and airplanes and bombs and things like that, but they're not doing nothing. They're not, you know, their, their, their lands are not expanding or anything like that, but look at the time of the Prophet Muhammad What did they have? When they fought in warfare, they had wooden spears, they had bones of animals, they had rocks, they had, you know, canvas bags and things like that. They had maybe axes and bows and arrows and things like that, but look, why were they so successful? Number one, because of their ikhlas, their sincerity to Allah. And number two, because of their ittiba of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the more that the Muslims follow, are more, the more the Muslims are sincere and they follow the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam more, then you'll see the Muslims becoming more successful and be removed of all the hardships and difficulties and things like this and humiliation that many of our brothers and sisters are going through today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. Amen. So, <clears throat> um, and the companions, when they learned from the Messenger of Allah, they didn't ask. They didn't ask questions unless it was something that they didn't understand. Normally they would watch. Okay, well, now look at that. Um, like for Hajj, for example. Same thing. Prophet, he says, take from me your Hajj rituals. He didn't sit there and explain to them, there's different types of uh, Hajj, you have Ifrad, and you have Qiran, and you have Tamattu', and you have to make your Ihram from here, and the Shurut of Ihram are this, and you, the Sunan of Ihram are this, and then you have to go to make Tawaf like this, and how did they learn all of these things? By watching. So, so the one companion narrated, said, okay, I saw the Prophet Muhammad's stones, he took seven stones, and he flipped them like that at the Jamaah seven times. And every one he would say, Allahu Akbar. So this is what the Sunnah is. Okay? The Sunnah is what the companions actually saw, or what the companions actually heard, or what the companions actually saw the Prophet approve of in their presence, or some of the Prophet Muhammad's physical characteristics or his behaviors. This is how much they love the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is everything. Right? Everything that he did, everything that he said, they've either memorized it or they wrote it down. So <clears throat> that's how they learned how to pray. And then the, they didn't have, right? Um, they didn't have the later understanding of the, the scholars of jurisprudence have with like the five legal categories wajib, mustahab, mubah, makru, haram. They didn't understand things like that. They understood. Whatever we see the Prophet do, we have to do it. They didn't ask, oh brother, is it Sunnah? Or, or do I have a choice to do it? You know, is it Makruh? You know, they knew. If they didn't see the Prophet Muhammad do it, they're not going to do it. If they saw the Prophet do it all the time, they knew that it's something which is very important. Okay, then it's wajib, I have to do it all the time. If they saw him do it occasionally, because there are some sunnah that the Prophet would do all the time. Like we were talking about one last night that he would do all the time. Okay, and how do we know? In the Arabic language, when you have the word kana, okay, kana, and a fi'l mudari, after it, kana yimshi. Okay? Min atraf, or min amam atraf al sufuf, right? Min nahi ila nahi. When you have in the Arabic language something when Allah or the Prophet Muhammad says, Kana Yamshi, Kana Yaf'al means that he would do it all the time. He would do it all of the time. So go we were talking about last night straightening the rows and things like that. From the practice of the Prophet Muhammad says something he would do all the time, he would walk from one end of the row until the next end of the row to make sure that the row was what? To make sure that the row was straight. But then you have other sunnah that the Prophet would do, what he would do occasionally. He would do it sometimes, and sometimes he wouldn't do it, okay? And <clears throat> this was sometimes to show the permissibility of doing something, okay? This was sometimes to show, make things easy upon the believers, to show that there's different variations of how to do a different type of worship, and things like that. So, 
um, the more we learn about the Sunnah, the more we learn about the different categories of the Sunnah. Like even the scholars of fiqh, scholars of jurisprudence, they've divided the Sunnah into categories, right? Like Sunnah Mu'akkada, right? Sunnah Ada, right? These different types of Sunnah, emphasized Sunnah and a regular type of Sunnah, okay? So Tartib bin Al-Qan, the last one, or the, 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 the uh, Al-Hadi Ashr, the Thani Ashr, the 11th and 12th Rukan, is Tashahud al Akhir wa Jalusulahu. Okay, is the last sitting for the Tashahud. The last sitting for the Tashahud. Okay, and uh, yeah, the last sitting for the Tashahud. Uh, and the Prophet he says, إِذَا قَعَدَ أَحَدُكُمْ فِي الصَّلَاةِ فَلْيَقُلْ أَتَّحِيَاتُ لِلَّهِ إِلَى آخِرِهِ وَقَالَ فِي الرِّوَاءِ الْأُخْرَى وَلَكِنْ قُلُوا أَتَّحِيَاتُ لِلَّهِ um, so, so sitting and reading the Tashahud. Okay, sitting and reading the tashahud is also a pillar from amongst the pillars of the prayer. What about the first tashahud? Let's say you're praying Dhor or Asr or Maghrib or Isha. There's two tashahuds, right? The first tashahud and the second tashahud. The last tashahud is a rukun. The first tashahud is what? A wajib. A wajib. Remember we talked about the difference between a rukun and a wajib. A rukun is if you don't come with it in the prayer or don't do it, then your prayer is invalid. A wajib is if what? If you forget it, then you need to do something to make it up. You need to do something to make it up in the prayer. Like sujood is sahab. Okay? Um, Thalith Ashar, the 13th pillar, is what? As salatu ala nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I got you. Right? As salatu ala nabi is sending peace upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, and this is from uh, the, the manners and showing that we truly love the Messenger of Allah والسلام, that whenever you hear his name mentioned you should get into the habit of sending the peace and blessings upon him this is an act of worship Allah does it are you better than Allah? the angels do it are you better than the angels? Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi Allah and his angels send salah upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu Ya ayyuha ladheena amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu tuslima Oh you believe, send salah upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam What is it? So this is an order, Allah is commanding us You have to send salah upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam So what is the reward that you get for sending salah upon the Messenger of Allah? First, what, is, what does salah mean? When we say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam What does that mean? Okay, dua what what does it mean? Yeah. Okay, that's the translation. Okay. All right. There's a bigger meaning than that. That's part of the meaning. And that's why, Subhanallah, Ibn Al Qayyim Al Jawziyah, he has a book just dedicated for this issue, Salah and Salam upon the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi and the meaning of it. So the scholars, they said that the meaning of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is Dhikr al-Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam fi mal al-A'la Is the mentioning of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's name amongst the angels in the heavens So when you say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you're asking Allah to mention the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's name Where? In the heavens, amongst the mal al-A'la, amongst the angels Okay? Ah as it came in hadith, no. So, um, what is the benefits from sending salah upon the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam? He said, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He says, Who, whoever sends salah upon me one time, then Allah will send salah upon you ten times. So, just how the Prophet Muhammad's <coughs> name is mentioned in the heavens ten times, when you say sallallahu alaihi wasallam, your name will be mentioned ten times in the heavens. Who doesn't want their name mentioned in the heavens amongst the angels? So that's why our tongue should constantly be right, moist with Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? Some of the companions came to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they asked. They says, who is the Bakhir? They says, who is the stingy person? Ah, right? They said, who is the stingy person? So the first thing that came to their mind, the stingy person is the one who has no, who has money, but he doesn't give any money to help the poor. He says, no, that's not the case. He says, the stingy person is the one who when my name is mentioned, 
they don't say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we need to get into the habit of whenever we hear the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu name, we try to make mention of him so that we can attain that great reward from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Is that the only salam the same one? I've heard people say other. Well, when the companions came to the Messenger of Allah, they says, Ya Nabi, kayfa nusalli alayk? And he said, what? Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim inna ka hamidu majeed wa baraka ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammad. The dua we say in a tahiyya. Right? Yeah. So, this is the, and there's different, um, you know, different variations of it according to the hadith. Okay, according to the hadith. Um, so, number one, when we make the, the, the tashahud, okay, another thing, how should your, your hands be? How should your fingers be? Prophet, kana yushir, bi isbu'ihi, right? Bi sababatihi, right? This is called what? A sababa in Arabic. This is called what? Al ibham, the names of the fingers, right? Ibham, sababa, wusta, khinsir, bunsir, right? It's important to know these when you start studying fiqh and things like that because you'll find, right, you might not find proper translations for them. The Prophet, he would do, right, takhleel bayna asabi' rijlihi with what? With al bunsir, with this one. Right, when he would wash his feet sometimes, he would go between with this pinky finger, right? And also when you understand how the Prophet would point in the tashahud, okay, he would, as it comes in some narrations, he would. Um, you know, make this symbol because the Arabs they had also sign language. They had sign language and they had um, movements with their fingers which would be used to signify a certain amount. So, some narrations that come which describe the way the Prophet Muhammad so would make the shahud would be he would link his thumb with his right wusta and point his index finger, or he would place the tip of his thumb to this knuckle on his middle finger and point his, uh, his finger like this. So one of the two ways, right? There's many different variations, but these are the most popular. Uh, one like this, or one like this, right? And when should you start the tashahud? That's another thing, right? And what are the benefits of doing the tashahud and pointing? Okay, tashahud, you're witnessing, okay? Oh. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi says, he says, when you stick your finger out for the tashahud, it is more severe on the shaitan than beating him with an iron pole. <laughs> beating him with an iron pole, when you stick your finger out for the tashahud. So, the more you stick, the longer you stick your finger out for the tashahud, the better, because you're beating the shaitan more with a, that, something which is similar to an iron pole. So many of us, we only stick it out when it comes to Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah. But when we understand the hadith, you should start from the beginning. As soon as you start, at tahiyyatu lillahi. And keep it pointed out all throughout the whole part of the prayer. Should you move it in a circular motion, up and down, keep it still? No. This is something uh, which many of the scholars differ in. Some say move it, some say up and down, some say in a circle, some say point. But at least you should have uh, it pointed. Pointed and your focus should be focusing on what? Your finger. As the Prophet Muhammad would do. His vision wouldn't be, his glance would not be up, it would be looking at his finger for tashahud. And then the last part, the last pillar, and then we're gonna go eat. Inshallah, we're being called to go eat breakfast. At taslimatan. Okay, are the two what? The two taslims. Okay, uh, the two taslims. As the Prophet he said, Tahrimuha at takbir wa tahliluha at taslim. Okay. That the sacredness of the prayer, or you enter into the prayer, and everything else becomes haram when you make the takbir, and the exiting of the prayer becomes when you what? When you do the taslim. How many taslims do you need to do? One or two? What is the rukun and what is a is a is a is a wajib and a sunnah? The right is rukun, and the left is sunnah. Ah, oh, test. So the right. When you say Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullah to your right side, then you've officially exited the <coughs> prayer. Okay? The Sunnah is to do two. Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullah. Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullah. What are some other variations? Sometimes the Prophet would say Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullah. Warabakatu. Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullahi Barakatu. Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullah. Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullah. Assalamu Alaikum. 
like this. So all these are warid and the Nabi Sallallahu All these variations came from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Even Salaam Alaikum, Salaam Alaikum, Salaam Alaikum. All of these came, all of these are permissible. Okay, but um, you should always follow the Imam. Okay, if you're in individual prayer, this is one thing, but when you're in the, uh, the congregational prayer, you cannot exit the prayer until the Imam is done. So somebody might say, well, okay, the Imam, he made the first Taslim on the right, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah, and his phone was ringing, right? So then he makes the first Taslim and then goes out of the prayer and then the Imam makes the second Taslim. You have not completed the prayer. Why? Because you haven't followed the Imam. You haven't followed the Imam. You have to follow the Imam from the beginning to the end of the prayer. Even if the Imam makes a mistake, you have to follow him in his mistake. Okay? And that is part of the respect and the honor for that position that he has and respect of that hadith that the Prophet Muhammad says. What about saying Ameen? This is another issue. Right, which many of us um, don't practice, or many of us tend to forget. There's a difference of opinion, right, amongst the scholars of fiqh and things like that. But we have clear, decisive hadith about the rewards of saying amin after the imam. Anybody know the reward of saying amin after the imam? Number one, what if the imam doesn't say amin? Do you say amin, or are you quiet? You should say amin. Out loud to yourself, whisper it, right? Some of them they don't say. That's upon them. Right? That's upon them. But you, because you want to get forgiven of your previous sins. Right. Because who's saying Amin with you? Angels. The angels. Yeah. Prophet Muhammad yeah. says, either yeah. either yeah. call it Imam Amin, Fuqulu Amin. And one hadith. If the Imam says Amin, all of you say Amin. And another hadith, it says that whoever is Amin agrees with the, the Ta'min, the Amin of the angels, then he has been forgiven of his of his previous sins. That was from sorry. Either or. Either Amin or Amin. And how should you say Amin? Should it be Amin or Amin, like that. Just how you would recite Yasin, okay? Yeah, is how many harakat? Two. Two. Seen, two. Right? So, so that's how you should recite Amin, right? This is how detailed the scholars of fiqh have actually studied these issues. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them and make us from amongst those who love Islamic knowledge and love learning and getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those who love to have the signs of success upon them. Seeking religious knowledge is a sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he says, Man yuridi bihi fi deen. That whoever Allah wants goodness for, he gives him an understanding in the religion. So may Allah increase us in understanding of the religion based upon Quran and Sunnah, based upon correct understanding and proper implementation. Jazakal khair for your time. May Allah reward all of you. Subhanaka lahumma bihamdika shadu an la ilaha ila anta astaghfiru wa tubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.